Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Um, and the truth tonight, okay, I, I, was, I met a couple of really, really cool people over the weekend, and we're going to talk about cardiac arrhythmias and high blood pressure. And I looked at it, and I thought, holy moly, I haven't done a talk like this in a long time. Um, it's interesting because the second half of this, we're going to talk about a lot of things that are restricted in our new socialist um, restricted environment. But you know, I know we used to have free speech. Don't bring that up. Okay. But, you know, now, um, interesting, a quote from Harvard Medical School. The primary purpose of commercially funded clinical research is to maximize financial return on investment, not health. And that's, um, you're going to see that throughout. And it's literally healthcare. I mean, healthcare, the care of the health, it's not outcome based. Now, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. And um, part of this is, is not going to be approved by the social media censorship that we have going on. And it's interesting, a lot of people don't even know that there's a censorship going on. Um, we've been demonetized about a year and a half ago. We've had about 10 videos that were wiped out. We've been um, uh, shadow banned and people, you know, we're supposed to have over 700,000 subscribers and we used to get like 20, 30,000 hits each time we do this. Now we're getting like two to 5,000 hits. So, so they're trying to, su um, suppress us and suppress this type of information. So if you, if you do appreciate this information and want to keep us going, I mean, hell, I'm going to be on an overturned box cart and a in the parking lot, screaming, not like the naked guy out there, but you know, just, okay, just for anybody that just joined us, okay, we do have a bar next door in a halfway house uh, a block away. And with the lockdown and the extra stress in society, we get occasional people that are a little bit out there and this guy is out there. <laughs> so go to Dr. B V I P and it won't be interrupted. Also go to Extreme Health Academy. I'm going to be on a uh, full-on webinar with these guys. It usually goes two, two and a half hours. But those are actually really fun. It sounds like, you know, hey, Sunday, want to hang out for three hours talking about, you know, it's not as fun as kayaking. <laughs> but it's really cool because they're, these are people with real stories and real successes. Journal of the American Medical Association, 2015. Many current practices that seem logical but are without evidence may be reconsidered and incorporated into a less dogmatic and more patient-centered approach to care. Really, less dogmatic. Have you, can you think of a more dogmatic approach? Something that you do it um, by rote. Okay, checking someone's blood pressure. Here's one, Journal of the American Medical Association. They found out 48,000 patients with heart failure. Okay, that means they got a good heart or heart damage. Heart damage. Okay, okay. Now they found out that people with higher systolic, higher outputs had lower death rates. In fact, a systolic of over 161. And this would be considered pathological by a lot of dogmatic practitioners. Instead of looking at how the body is adapting, like over the last couple of weeks, we talked about genetic, genetic expression. What is that? It has to do with how you're adapting. We're looking at different stress levels, okay, and disease levels. And even when I talk to different healthcare professionals, which in this world, there are very few, most everybody practices that dogmatic approach. Like, and because what do you do for, for arthritis? Drugs. What do you do for um, uh, high blood pressure? Drugs. Okay, what do you do? You know, and, and in the medical system, that's what it is because it's an industry-funded system. It's not independent researchers. Independent research are, aren't going out there to say, hey, look, cardiac arrhythmias, let's look at the cause. Wow, high blood pressure, let's look at the cause. No, everybody has to be brought down to the same level. Now, when we're talking about the heart and autonomic function, your heart has, or your body has two nerve supplies, okay, and they're automatic. They're the stuff. It's like, um, I cut my finger, okay, this week, okay, I'm just drilling some metal, okay, and, and, Okay, I know, I know every, every guy and girl in here that's done this, okay? You have a long screw. You're kind of holding that part way, but you got to hold the, the stuff like this. 
and the screw misses and the edge of the drill that's spinning goes into the finger, okay? Rips up the skin, flips it around, and of course I'm working on the garden. So I pour a little water on it, wrap some electric tape around it, and finish the day. Okay, at the end of the day, it's all white and funky because I didn't put anything to soak up the... Is anyone... Raise your hand if you've done that, please. Okay, thank God. Okay, three quarters of the population here said that. Okay, okay, but the cool thing is, after washing it and taping it, I, got, I can literally don't have a flap of skin there anymore. I mean, it's starting to heal. Within a week, this thing will be all brand new. I mean, and that's what the body does. And, and so, so when we look at this, this is the automatic. I don't need to say, hey, look, I can't talk. I got to heal this. <laughs> no, it works. Now, the heart, though, has two nerve supplies. One out of the sympathetic nervous system, which is located in the middle of the back area. It's called thoracolumbar. And that's, that's the, the stress level of the heart. The other, the parasympathetic, is located up in the upper cervical spine. And that's the diesel engine of the heart. So the diesel engine of the heart, the parasympathetic nervous system, is the one that just keeps going 24-7. I mean, right a little bit, a couple of weeks after conception, I think it's five weeks after conception, the heart starts and it doesn't stop for the next 120 years, if you're lucky. Now, what you've got, the way I would describe this to, to my students, you've got the parasympathetic nervous system supplying the pacemaker of the heart, the sinoatrial node. And you've got the heart like this, okay? You got the atrium on top and the ventricles on the bottom. And so if both contracted the same way, you wouldn't have blood flow. So the sinoatrial node is the pacemaker because when it contracts, the ventricles fill up with fluid. And then and what you hear when you're listening to someone's heart, you know how it goes, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Those are the vowels slapping together. So, bam, this contracts, the atrium contracts, then the ventricles open up and they fill up with blood. And then when they contract, then the atrium fill up with blood. So, blood goes from the body to the right atrium, down to the right ventricle, out to the lungs, from the lungs, back to the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, out to the body. And veins and arteries in the heart just are the direction to and from the heart. Okay, it's, it's kind of cool. So the sinoatrial node um, gives that initiating, then it goes to the AV node. Okay, and I would say that so the students would remember that that slows down the impulse and allows the ventricles to fill. I know what you're thinking. Don't you wish your instructor did that? Because now you know the sinoatrial node and the AV node slows down it so that it allows the ventricles to fill up. Then it goes to the, you know, bundle of his, the Purkinje fibers, and then it initiates the contraction. We're going to look at the disaster when you put a uh, wire in the heart for a pacemaker. Okay, what happens with that? But just, just know the natural conductivity heart, and this is how it works. You also have a sensor in the neck, because off of that heart comes the aorta, and that aorta there's a couple of branches, internal and external carotid. One goes inside, one goes outside. At that junction, there's the coolest things ever. It's a chemoreceptor, so it senses carbon dioxide, and it's a pressure sensor, so it senses blood pressure. And in, since carbon dioxide's an acid, okay, you breathe and that alkalinizes the system. But since your body's pH has to be between 7.35 and 7.45, the blood, Okay, you're going to be using respiration and heart rate in order to maintain that. Because you get one point above or one point below, you're dead. Okay, so these sensors in there, so when carbon dioxide levels go up, the heart rate increases to get uh, blood to the uh, lungs. And you can do that carbon dioxide transfer. When the carbon dioxide levels go low, the heart rate slows down until the carbon dioxide levels build up. And it, it works that way. Isn't that interesting? I know, I know, it's kind of cool. So does that mean that if you have a problem with the neck or with these sensors or the body is under physical, chemical, or emotional stress that you can alter that rate and rhythm of the heart? Duh. Okay. So what is a cardiac arrhythmia? I love going to the Mayo Clinic because who doesn't like Mayo? No, okay, okay. They're supposed to be really respected and some of their stuff is just funny as all hell. Okay, heart ryth rhythm problems, arrhythmias, occur when the electrical impulses that coordinate the heartbeats don't work properly. 
really don't work properly. Too fast, too slow. What's the causative factor? Are they looking at the sympathetic parasympathetic nerve supply to the heart? Are they looking at the um, baroreceptors or the chemoreceptors in the neck? Are they looking at any autonomic function at all? No. What's the symptoms? Okay, racing, heart rate, slow, chest pain, shortness, lightheaded, dizziness, sweating, fading. Okay, you in the back row, read that bottom line. Okay, no, I know, it's impossible. Okay, uh, what are the causes of it? Again, according to the Mayo Clinic. Um, now, if you look at this, remember we're talking about genetic and genetic expression. A heart attack that's occurring right now, and when we did the series on heart attacks, you knew that heart attacks over 80% of the time are neurologic, not claudication. Um, a scarring from a prior heart attack, changes in your heart structure from cardiomyopathy. Now, does that ha sound like it's something that happens quickly or something that decays over time? So would that change in cardiac myopathy be an adaptive physiologic response, like an adaptation like we've been talking about, that it's not really a disease? High blood pressure. Is that a, a disease or an adaptation? When we're looking at overactive or underactive thyroid, is that um, an adaptation to toxicity and deficiency or distress, or does your thyroid just not work one day? Okay, okay. It, so, so when we talk about dogmatic approaches, again, there's not a lot of critical thinking in any aspect of medical, uh, the medical system. Now, the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart, I'm going to describe how stress kills this person, and, and this is a person facing us, okay, same person. Um, now, this is the right side, this is the left side. Now, during a heart attack, and this is literally how stress kills, um, it, it, you know, when you see in the movies somebody having a heart attack, what do they do? They grab their left jaw, left arm, left everything. That's because the embryologic origins, the diaphragm is connected to the trapezius. Now, if you irritate the diaphragm on the left where the heart is, it spasms out the left trapezius. That's why you get that left-sided symptom. The right side is where the gallbladder and liver are. Now, those are also called the emotion organ or stress organ. So under any physical stress, any chemical stress, or any emotional stress, the liver's got to work harder to process those toxins. And when you're in chiropractic college, you'll learn that, you know, right-sided shoulder Chronic spasms could indicate gallbladder or liver dysfunction. I mean, that's just common. Um, but here's how the stress kills. And this is something that, that was brilliant. We did a cardiac arrhythmia study back in the late 90s, okay? Uh, yes, people were still alive. Don't give me that look, okay? <laughs> okay, so, so think of this. Physical, chemical, emotional stress. What if your body has an intelligent design? We know the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart is the top of the rib cage area, right where that person has a massive right rotation of those vertebrae. So physical, chemical, emotional stress, that right trapezius is increasing, increasing, increasing its pressure. Now the top of the rib cage area there, that's the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart. Eventually it pulls it over so far, bam, the body fires a sympathetic charge down to the heart, putting the heart in ventricular fibrillation, stopping the heart. So when we see a rotation in that area, it's dangerous. When we see a central location, that's safe. Okay, so that's literally the clinical mechanism of how stress kills. And it has to do with an instant response. And you can see this. Like I just had a guy from, oh, Chicago. And I told him, okay, you know, I said, put your right arm up. Why? Because That'll start to move the scapula over and derotate that over. Put your head up because he had a reverse curve in his neck. I mean, there's so many things you can do to de-stress that out, but you got to know what it is. Um, yeah, we covered that. Normal heart rate and rhythm. So types of arrhythmias. Now, isn't this weird? 60 to 100 beats per minute. That's normal. Anything over that's too much. Anything under that's too little. Now, does that go on lung function or health of the blood? or stress level at the time? No, this is a dogmatic approach. Why? Because we don't have any critical thinking in medicine. Everything, everybody should react the same, right? Okay, would, would that work with every industry? No, no, that's foolishness. So knowing that it's a pharmaceutical industry funded uh, medical system, uh, what type of therapies do we have? Well, drugs. 
I know you're thinking, whoa, what a thunk it. Oh my God. Treating a, a mechanical and neurologic structure, okay, with a toxic chemical, okay? So, cord corduroy. And remember, when we talk about medications, you know that me medications typically can cause the symptom they're designed to treat, like the side effect of antipsychotics, like our naked man running in the parking lot will say, um, is suicide and suicidal thoughts. Okay, the side effect of muscle relaxants, which attack the base of the brain, okay, is muscle spasms. The, the side effect of joint pain relievers, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, is joint destruction from proteoglycan production reduced. Let's look at the side effects of cortisone, which is for arrhythmic problems. Oh, a new or worsening of the irregular heartbeat problem. Faster, slow, pounding heart, it's feeling like you might pass out. Where, can you see this? Okay, but this is where you get industry-funded um, tests and studies and the industry-funded government. Okay, it's amazing. Now, the side effects, easy breathing, shaking, tremor, loss of coordination, um, heart block, and heart failure, which is a bummer. Um, no, heart failure is really bad because you only have one. Okay, warnings, but potential fatal toxicities. Um, most important is pulmonary toxicities. That means you're taking a drug that for the heart rate and rhythm. Now, does anyone think they're suffering from a um, drug deficiency syndrome where this would be totally appropriate? It, it, and you're going to laugh at that, you cruel <laughs> bastard. <laughs> okay. okay, so when you look at this, I mean, that just sounds, it doesn't make sense. But you're going to negatively affect the pulmonary area, the lungs. And, and we're talking about the heart rate and rhythm, which is connected to the lung function. Um, even in patients at high risk of arrhythmic death in whom the cytotox or toxicity of cordyrone is an acceptable risk, cordyrone poaches a major management that could be life-threatening. No kidding. So what is normal blood pressure? And this is what I ask all the time. I get people coming in and they'll go, yes, my blood pressure is high. Okay, do you check it? All the time. Jesus. Okay. Okay, what's normal? 120 over 80. Okay. Now I'm talking to like a 350 pound plumber. Okay. And I'll go, okay, should your 12 year old gymnastic daughter be the same? I think so. Okay. Okay. Good. So now we know the mental, okay, you know, the, the, the delusion or the programming, okay, that the programming is successful, that he's watched those beautiful pharmaceutical commercials and hasn't paid attention to the side effects. Okay. In reality, this is not true. 120 over 80 is not normal. Um, and in fact, Joint National Committee meets about every 10 years. They're going to meet again coming up. Uh, Joint National Committee 6, they said 120 over 80, thou shalt, and then the white smoke comes out. The... Oh, you're right, Victor. That's how they choose the Pope. Okay, this is just a group of pharmaceutical reps and people that own hospitals, and they decide what the heck their guys are going to be checking for normal. Because you don't want to go in and say, look, the person that doesn't exercise, the person that does exercise, the person that has a healthy diet, the person that took 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C today in his liter and a half of water and is the second liter, okay, that person might have healthier blood than somebody that is, you know, juicing up on, on Splenda or Red Bull, okay? Then they changed that in 2004 to 150 and over 75. So that means everybody in America, your new normal was 150 and over 75. It was 120 over 80. Now, 120 over 80, the old normal was now the new hypertensive. I know. Weed was not legal back then, so how did they come up with this crap? Okay, and so think of that. And then in 2014, because you, and, and this is what I'll tell my patients, you're taking a drug that slows the oxygen down to the brain. Do you think that helps your brain function or slows it down? You know what they'll say? I'm not a doctor. And I'll go, God, my slow voice really has need some work. Okay, so now in 2014, if you're over 60 like me, um, it should be 150 over 90. Really? Really? 150 over 90 for everybody, whether you're hydrated or not. I mean, can you see how crazy this is? In England, it's 100 plus your age. In Germany, they don't lower it unless it's over 180. In India, they want it over 140. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different parameters, but it's foolishness to check it. How many people have white coat hypertension? 
Did you know a cold room, a full bladder, all this stuff raises blood pressure. I mean, it, it's, it's actually a very, very poor indicator of health. So if you're going to check your blood pressure, if you're going to check it, and, and honestly, how many people in here have a dog? Okay, good. Uh, what, what was their blood pressure this morning? They didn't check. Did you check your dog's blood pressure? You, what? Oh, you're right. That's an animal that can regulate its own physiology, okay? The human can't. Wow. God bless that TV. The programming really works. Okay, so if you're going to check it, let your arm rest level with your heart and diaphragmatic nasal breathe for 10 minutes. Okay, that's easy. And if you want to learn how to diaphragmatic breathe, a patient just gave me a great suggestion. They put a weight on their tummy, and when they breathe in, they want the, the, the weight to go up, so to help them. And they breathe out, the, the weight goes in. So, okay. They do that for 10 minutes. She has a good oxygen transfer. Your, your hand is level and you'll get a, a, a number. What really in actual fact is you want the difference between the high and the low to be around 40. That would be ideal. If the difference between the high and the low is greater than that, that means your blood's not efficient at doing its job. Okay, so that means juicing, blending, supplements, vitamin C, water, you know, the, the, find out the physical, chemical, or emotional stress you're under. If it's less than 40, it means your heart is working really, really fast, so you're under a stress state. So find the physical, chemical, or emotional stress. None of these are drug deficiency syndrome. You take the calcium, I mean, you could take calcium blockers, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, cholesterol drugs are always in there. Let's look at the American Journal of Cardiology, 2010. Calcium channel blockers are widely used to control hypertension. However, they could increase heart failure. Again, Heart failure, bad. Blood, high blood pressure, an adaptive physiologic response to stress. It's not drug deficiency syndrome. Beta blockers, early death from heart disease, cancer, or diabetes. Diuretics, the Mr. Fit trial. This was huge. I mean, big, big trial. Their, blood, their goal was to get it down to 140 over 90. However, the ones treated with diuretics had the highest mortality rate. Why? Because you're causing kidney damage. It's causing your body to lose fluid. They give you an MK or omega potassium to take with it because your body is losing potassium, and then that causes cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, so, I mean, yes, well, I'm taking it, but I'm also going to take the mega, mega potassium. And then you do that for 10 years, then you develop kidney damage. I mean, it's, does anybody think that high blood pressure is from not enough meds? Okay, yes, I know, the pharmaceutical industry. University of Alabama, they said that this risk of stroke increased by one-third for every blood pressure medication taken. That means you're taking a drug because the doctor said it was the silent killer, okay? And the drug that you're taking can kill you. You're in as much trouble at the time you're on three medications that achieve excellent control as when your hypertension is untreated, which is amazing. Again, look at the upper thoracic area. We're seeing a massive subluxation. Why? Because this person had physical, chemical, and emotional stress. Did they have high blood pressure or low-functioning thyroid or digestive disorders or sleep problems? No. Their body was adapting correctly based on the stress level, physical, chemical, and emotional. Okay, let's say you got the cardiac arrhythmia. It's not working correctly. I know. I know what you're thinking. The heart has two nerve supplies from here and from here. Let's bypass that. Clear! Okay. This is cardioversion, okay? We're gonna pass a massive electric charge in there. Um, not, not really stopping the heart, but kind of interrupting it because we're a lot smarter than the body. <sighs> I mean, how much weed could these guys smoke to come up with this? Okay, let's look at it. A medical procedure done to restore the normal heart rhythm. Um, I should write down, we're not gonna look at what the actual cause is. Usually, a scheduled patient procedure is performed in a hospital. It's different from a defibrillator. Defibrillator delivers much more powerful shocks. However, this could dislodge blood clots, cause life-threatening strokes, uh, can cause a worse um, heart rhythm. Um, the AFFIRM study, 4,000 patients, ages 65 and older. Um, the patients were randomized to either rhythm control using electric cardioversion and medication, or just using drugs as beta blockers, dioxin. 
To the surprise of the investigators, the primary outcome um, mortality was worse in the rhythm control group. The caveat to this was the use of antiarrhythmic drugs was associated with increased mortality. The drugs to alter the rate and rhythm of the heart had an increased mortality or death. Mind blowing. Cardioversions were randomized to rhythm control, compressing cardioversions within six weeks, or rate control adjusted dotus of beta blockers. Okay. There was no significant difference in primary outcome of death from cardiovascular causes, nor of any significant uh, um, secondary outcomes, including death. In patients with AFib and congestive heart failure, a routine strategy of rhythm control does not work to, uh, does not reduce the rate of death from cardiovascular causes. Why? Why would it not work? Because, again, dogmatic approach without looking at how the body actually works. What is the normal rate and rhythm of the heart? How is that governed? Should we look at a mechanical distortion altering that? Cardiac ablations. And again, this is putting a hot wire inside of the heart, it goes up a vein into the heart, and you burn nerves. Okay, because remember the, the nerve supply to the heart, SA node, AV node. Okay, bundle of hiss. Okay, so they're going to go in there and they burn the wires off of that wall or burn the nerves on the inside of the right ventricle. Now, don't give me that look. Okay, I've got a patient here going, are you serious? Have they lost their mind? Okay, yeah, so you got a guy that's lived, you know, lived 50, 60 years, okay, half a century or more, and he's talked into this procedure. What caused the nerves inside of the heart to malfunction? Again, what will the knowing um, me mechanic who's got going to burn the nerves? He doesn't know. So this is a procedure to scar to destroy tissue in your heart that is allowing incorrect correct electrical signals. Um, what are the risks of this? Um, well, it, bleeding at the site, damage to the blood vessels, puncture the heart, damage to the heart's electrical system, which could worsen it requiring a pacemaker. Again, increased stroke, narrowing the veins that carry the blood to the lungs and heart, damage to your kidneys due to the diet in the procedure. Sudden cardiac death, okay, after radiofrequency ablation. Um, risk of sudden death is highest within two days after the procedure. Mind blowing, mind blowing. We've, we have cardiologists as patients. And I say, Doc, have you ever thought? of looking at the sympathetic and parasympathetic structures in the body, or even doing a nerve scan, doing a heart rate variability to see if that person is, has a low-functioning parasympathetic or what their autonomic system is. I mean, it, it, mind blowing. Pacemakers. So you got this pacemaker. Batteries over on the left side. It goes into the superior vena cave and, and is, it's a wire, and it goes down through the top part on the right side of the heart, and so it goes down through this tricuspid valve that separates the right atrium and the right ventricle. And it's jammed into the floor of the right ventricle with this little trident type spear. Okay. So now it's going to override the electrical conductivity of the heart. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait a second. That valve is closing over a wire for the rest of the person's life. Yeah. Now what we get in here, we get a lot of people with, you know, st structure anomalies. And they'll say, yeah, man, we're going through the battery for that heart, you know, pacemaker, you know, about every two, three months, and they're supposed to last a year. Okay, now, uh, here we go. Uh, according to the National Institute of Health, faulty electrical signals causing the heart rhythms, pacemakers are used, low energy to, to bypass it. Now, I know what you're thinking. We have a biologic structure that has two different nerve supplies to it that has been functioning well for 60,000 years, perhaps 100,000. And what could possibly go wrong if we put a metal thing in there that bypasses it using a foreign different type of electrical thing, okay? Um, coordinate the signals. So what happens? Uh, well, risk of a pacemaker infection, allergy to the dye used in anesthesia, bruising, swelling at the generator site, Damage to your blood vessels or nerves and a collapsed lung. Um, more than 40,000 patients are fitted with pacemakers in the UK. 
as several hundred thousand have the implanted cardiovert defibrillators. 40 million people have the device in the country. A third of unexpected deaths among heart patients are caught with pacemakers or could be caused by malfunctions. Scientists say there is evidence that the implants could be leading cause of mortality and, the war and warn the findings are a major concern. Around 14,000 patients die in the UK each year having been fitted with a pacemaker, um, half of whom have been in relatively good health. The implants were to be blamed for about 2,000 deaths a year. Faulty pacemakers. This study shows the leading cause of mortality in the developed world could be attributed to heart device problems. We assume they are infallible, but they're not. <laughs> Frankly, we know there's only one medical procedure that is sanctified by God and completely infallible, and it starts with a V, baby, and everybody gets the same shot no matter what. And since people are questioning that, we take away your choice. So infallibility ain't the pacemaker. <sighs> you can smell the sarcasm. Canadian Journal of Cardiology. Unprecedented number of recalls. Why? You know, I mean, we've gone over the 66 uh, vaccines that were discontinued and multiple hundreds of different drugs that were discontinued. So, you know, you know, they're human. Um, there's evidence that prolonged um, right ventricular apical pacing is not only bad for your heart, but bad for your health. And this turns out that if you're electrically stimulating that heart on a regular basis with, with something foreign, it damages your heart. Okay, now if you've had a major neurologic damage, if you've had some, some, a bullet severing the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart, if you've had something, but I've seen quadriplegics that don't need pacemakers. Okay, do, do you understand? So, so there's something not right here. This is dangerous. You're looking at an x-ray of a girl with a reverse curve in her neck and, and a low functioning parasympathetic. That is dangerous. So if you're a chiropractor and you see that, you don't need to scare the patient. You just need to say, look, we have an area of concern here. We're going to get you out of this, this parasympathetic nervous system state as quickly as possible. Okay, and, and I would check her within a week, but get very aggressive. Have her do everything she can get the stress off that nervous system. Uh, 15 years high blood pressure, okay? On the left, before, on the right, after. Do you see any structural changes inside of that? And you could even say, you know, you ever have those heart palpitations and, and you take a deep breath and it goes away? Yeah. Where do you get that? Okay, you, just mind blown. So literally, if you're looking for um, heart health, if you're looking for the solution to cardiac, um, a, a cardiac arrhythmias, if you're looking to the solution of thick blood, okay, or blood that's under stress, there's three things you got to look at. Physical stress chemical stress, and emotional stress. There's five things you gotta do. Number one, you gotta check your nervous system. How do you do that? We do nerve scans, full body thermography, digital x-rays. We're looking for parts. We're doing heart rate variability, rolling thermal scan, surface electromography. If anybody has a better nerve scan system than we do, by God, tell me, because I'm an equipment nut. I would freaking love it. I just got the best live blood cell analysis machine from Italy. And I got an anchor in the next room. You guys can see it later. It's just totally bitching. So you got to get the proper nerve supply. You got to get regular exercise because that gets movement and that stimulates that cerebellum that controls the frontal lobe. Proper nutrition. This means that when cultures prey over food, that's because it becomes you. Sufficient rest. This means six and a half to seven and a half hours of deep sleep, not getting up to pee sleeping through the night. And doc, I got to give you our nutrition report because you'll, you'll, you'll see it. It's totally cool. Okay. And prayer and meditation. Why? Because this puts you in the parasympathetic nervous system state, the rest digest or repair for just a few minutes a day. Plus it's kind of cool to connect with a being that's greater than you. Okay. That, I, I think it's neat. -o. Okay. I mean, we used to have a country, one nation under God. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're, we're going to stop the cardiac arrhythmia section right now. We're going to continue on to the stuff that will not be approved by the Ministry of Health and our current um, 
uh, sensor media group, I mean, social media group. Okay, so, but on the, on the front cover of this, it's interesting. Because if you felt that, that the shutdown, the lockdown, that you're essential, you're not essential, was not constitutional, you were absolutely right. And in fact, employees to, um, to work unhindered is guaranteed by this amendment. No st state shall make or enforce any law which will abridge the privileges or um, immunities of citizens in the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property due process without due process of law or deny the per any person within its jurisdiction of equal protection under the laws. That means that Costco um, has just as much right to be open as the church. That means that the gun stores and weed stores have as just as much right op to be open as the hair salons. Okay, and if anybody has ever had a parent that was a cocktail waitress, okay, and with four kids as a single mom, okay, my mom, okay, that she, she ended up going into casting and stuff, okay, but when she first got out, okay, that's what her job. Uh, anyone want to call her not essential? No, come on. <laughs> yeah, think of that. And we've gone through a year and a half of this? Freaking wake up. We're all set? Okay, bye-bye. I'll see you guys later. And we're going to be back next week with some more anatomy and physiology and cool stuff that will be approved by the Ministry of Health this week.